I might just start with one. I, I'll say as part of our work here at the Institute for Policy Studies, um, we do work on Latin America. And I will say among the biggest conflicts that we are seeing across Latin America is an increase in mining companies going down to Latin America to extract. They're largely Canadian, Australian mining companies going down, creating enormous conflict with local farmers, I will say, also creating uh, human rights conflicts. But what the mining companies will tell you is there is such increased demand from China, from India, that uh, you would be crazy, you countries down there not to mine. Um, and I want to mention that the positive part of this story is several governments have now stopped the mining uh, for environmental reasons, for the reasons you've raised. The Salvadoran government, no new mining contracts. The Costa Rican government has just stopped open pit mining. And the farmers, on the other hand, just to give you a piece of it, and I'm curious, Dennis, where, where, where you come down in terms of what's needed to uh, speed up the transition to sustainable agriculture that you mentioned. But a number of governments motivated more by the rising costs of petroleum and chemical inputs and also by the rising cost of imported food are pursuing policies that encourage sustainable farming, sustainable agriculture, uh, agroecology. Uh, almost everywhere that we're getting reports from allies, there's been a growth in incentives around around that, that farming. So I'm curious just for, for all of you, one, how you take on, how do we stop the fact that China, India, Brazil, growing fast, are increasing uh, demand for both fossil fuels and minerals? How, how do we factor that in? I think um, so that, as well as what are ways to speed up the transition to the things that, that each of you uh, were talking about? What are the sorts of policies, and I'm curious, I noticed two of you are sitting there in Seattle, you know, the city that gave us the $15 minimum wage. Um, are you thinking that most of the stimuli for this in the U.S. will come from progressive states and cities as we sit on the eve of, of, of an election, or, or do you have hope for some policies at the federal level? So let me stop there. As you think about it, let me ask here any of our colleagues uh, sitting here around me if you would like to add in to the conversation here. Uh, we have Sarah Van Gelder from Yes Magazine, who's visiting <laughs> from David's hometown there over uh, in Seattle. And um, Harley, could you bring the phone over to Sarah so that people can, uh, can hear her question? Uh, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you, too. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm curious about uh, sort of following up on the mining question because so much of our of what we rely on comes from minerals, right? Our whole high tech and our whole lifestyle is really built around having access to these kinds of minerals, um, and yet they seem like they are unrelentingly environmental disasters. So, a sort of a small question around that is, you know, the, I think the natural step basically says you should not be taking things out of the earth's crust. You know, that's just we can't just we can't do that anymore. Is that how, what you all think? And on a larger scale, there's some people who, who basically believe we can kind of slot in green practices where we have had non-green practices and basically keep our way of life pretty much the same. And I'm, I'm coming to have some real doubts about that, and I'd, I'd love to hear what you all think. Can we, can we actually keep the same way of life we've had up till now? Um, or is there, are we talking about not only changing our economy, but really changing our whole way of life? Great. And time for one more. Anyone else here uh, inside the room who would like to add anything at this moment? Robert. Robert yeah, uh, Robert Nadeau, since you've got the microphone right there. Thank you. Yeah, I, just, I, I think the sobering conclusion I keep coming back to in all of these very wonderful debates is uh, the fact that we've got now uh, a decade perhaps, um, to at absolute most to go through a massive transition on all levels and scales and create new institutional processes um, worldwide. <laughs> it sounds uh, rather intimidating. I, I can conceive of scenarios where this can happen, but uh, that's going to involve, I think, a whole lot of struggle 
uh, and a whole lot of breakdown of existing systems. And it's not a pleasant vision, but it, as far as I can see, it's the only way forward. Great. Thank you, Robert. So let's start right back with you, David. Uh, any reactions to these comments? Yeah, I want to kind of come back to the um, uh, to the, to the basic frame of the discussion. Um, it's interesting that a lot of our a lot of our comments have focused on mimicking nature, which is uh, in in our institutions and behavior, uh, which is key. But I also note that there's a deeper level of working with nature. Uh, working with Earth generative systems, which I know is a deeper piece of, uh, of Jason's work. Um, it is, I think, very integral to, to Dana's work, and it's certainly uh, integral to the new agriculture that Dennis is talking about. So I want to make sure that we bring that into the frame. Now, I also notice that, particularly in our questions, instead of further pursuing, what what would it look like <laughs> if we are working with Earth and basically building a civilization that works with Earth um, um, versus focusing this conversation on, you know, how do, how do we arrange the politics to move forward? Now, that said, I'd come back to the, uh, to again, the basic frame that uh, a key to moving forward to a new human civilization is fundamentally changing our shared species story, our cultural story. Uh, you know, we're essentially trained, educated, raised to think of Earth more as a machine. Um, you know, what I call in the, in the Change the Story book, uh, a sacred money and markets story um, that has us framed as money-seeking robots living on a dead rock. <laughs> Now, you know, just fundamentally changing our perception of who we are and our deeper relationship to Earth as a living system and ourselves as members of that community that is continuously maintaining the regenerative conditions essential to life, uh, that that to me represents the potential breakthrough. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear each of you comment further on the on the piece of living with nature, not just like nature. Um, and also thoughts about how do we move forward, changing our whole self-perception as a culture, as a global society. Great, thank you, David. Uh, Jason, uh, and I know Dana wants to say, Dana, do you wanna go next and then, yeah, go ahead. Your, your, your audio is not on. Yeah, we can't hear you, Dana. Sorry. There. Wait, uh, is, that, is that from your end, Noel, or is that from uh, Dana's end? No, <laughs> Dana, I think we should. Could we hear you now, Dana? Dana, go ahead. Try again. I hope so. I've unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you go next, and then we'll go to Jason and Dennis. Okay. Super. Go ahead. Well, what, what I wanted to put that's even underlying the question of, you know, do we work with nature? We actually have to accept the reality that we are nature. And and if you can't like fundamentally say that with a it, then we all all bets are off. Um, and the reality is is not only are we nature um, and we are part of nature just like every other species out there, that also means we are not immune to the laws of natural selection. And, and and we can't just ignore that that will have an effect on us. Um, and so when we think about bringing about the world that we want to thrive in, that we're capable of thriving in, that we want for us, um, it, it does behoove us to make that connection that we are nature. Um, therefore, we better behave like nature. And the fundamental premise under natural selection is quite simple. Uh, you can spend a whole semester in school studying it, or you can accept that it's adapt or die. I mean, that's like bottom line. And, and we see adaptations in nature, very, very rapid evolutionary changes under two conditions. One is under extreme threat. 
Um, and so when conditions are so bad that if you don't figure it out, you're toast. You're completely removed from the gene pool. That's the end of the game. Um, we actually see rapid, rapid changes in the genetic pool and therefore the behaviors and adaptations in species. The other place that we see it is when life is so great that your brain has so much fat um, that it doesn't know what to do with it and it can afford to take those risks. So both ends of the spectrum where it's like, yeah, sure, why not? What's the worst that can happen? I lose a few members of the, of the population or I better do this or I'm really in trouble. And we come to a place in, in global society today where we have, we actually have both of those. We have in our world, um, in, in the developed world, this, is, this very um, white panel uh, in front of us here, we have these options. Um, our brains are fat. We have the freedom to innovate, cushion, we can take these risks. But we also see incredible innovations in places of the world where they're on the edge. Um, in fact, things are changing and there's a heck of a lot more creativity being seen in these places where if they don't figure it out, that's the end. Um, and, uh, and so that's where these sorts of, we, 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 are, we are nature. Once again, we are, we're copying that same sort of phenomena. We shouldn't be surprised that we're really lackadaisical anywhere in between those two extremes. Great. Yeah, thanks so much, Dana. Jason, we'll go back to you now. Yeah, and I think what I might address are two of the comments that um, were brought up uh, by people in the room with you. Um, the, the first one was a, a, a question about what do we do about China and Brazil, and, and the assumption there is that, you know, this in the places where um, humanity is growing the fastest and the, and the, the new burdens, if you will, uh, is is growing the most rapid and and I just wanted to make a comment about that that I um, certainly whenever we get invited uh, our organization um, to help and provide models um, we you know we're happy uh, to do so but um, I think this gets I wanted to the thing that really poked me with that with that question was that I think that we are always looking to tell others how they need to do something differently and mm -hmm. And you know we we break all the records for wastefulness consumption uh, and your responsibility uh, here at home at the same time that we have you know the lion's share of the wealth and the military might and and the ability to do something about it so so I think that that um, we need to clean up our own act uh, as the first step um, as the step that we are responsible for the most and control and certainly we know that that others will follow, uh, and that others will that our others are following. Unfortunately, of the models that we have, and and so nothing is more paramount than than changing the way we live and the way we interact with life here at home. So that was the first thing I just wanted to just address, and then to get at Sarah's comments about about mining and minerals, you know, and I and that one caught my attention because I grew up in a mining town, a heavy metal mining town uh, that is infamous for environmental degradation, Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, home of, of nickel. And I saw firsthand uh, absolute degradation of, of, of the landscape. Um, when it comes to materials and chemicals and products, um, to get at, I think, what Sarah was um, bringing up, I do think that there are things that we need to simply stop doing, uh, stop using, stop making. I, I think that it, it is a false trap that we um, are in where people think that we can just invent human-made processes to control these things uh, and to, you know, to limit exposure. This is a big topic that's in the industry right now. It's okay as we have a system to control the exposure, uh, even though we've learned time and time again that things always end up where we don't intend them. And any kind of system that requires constant human vigilance, especially in generations that are yet to be born, I think is immoral. And this, if you use this framing, and 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 the you know the basic framing, as as Dana talks about, is always that you know life should create life creates conditions for life. Um, if you take that framing, then that you you can't reconcile the idea of putting a burden on those not yet born, our species and others as part uh, part of that framing that it, it doesn't it doesn't hold water this is why I feel like things like nuclear power is actually immoral 
uh, things like uh, what we call redless chemicals, where there's there is essentially no safe uh, level of exposure um, as, as something we just need to get out of our uh, our thinking, get out of our supply chains uh, completely. Uh, and these are part. This is part of the living building challenges to begin to do that. And so I, anyway, those are two of the questions that really struck a chord with me that I wanted to respond to. And uh, I'll pass the baton at this point. Great, uh, Dennis. Take it away. You're on mute, Dennis. I'm going to unmute you in a second. So just give me yeah, a hang, hang on one second here, Dennis. We're... Okay. okay, you're on. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, the, the, the toughest part about running the anchor late when you pass me the baton with this group is that I'm here constantly scribbling down questions, then comments, then answers that have been given by others. <laughs> fully aware that you do not want a, a half-hour essay from me, but let me at least briefly address a few things that are still out there kind of as snags. One, will leadership come from states and cities? My guess is almost certainly yes. That's where the most creative things are happening here and abroad. That's probably a transitional phase. The world is constantly turning to different levels for different kinds of things. If, if you wanted to end uh, racial uh, injustice, you probably were never going to do that by relying upon Mississippi to do it and be the leader that had to come at a higher level if you want to end the war, it can only be done nationally. But, but, but there are wonderfully creative things happening in the sustainability space in states to some extent and especially in most progressive cities around the world. We may be going into an era very much like it was about 400 years ago when cities were the leading states on the planet. Second, with regard to toxicity in general, I, I'm, I'm just more and more excited about the opportunities for green chemistry. It, it's hardly even a standard discipline yet. The vast majority of chemistry departments do not have a green chemist on their faculty. But the concept of building things using stuff that is only in every form, non-toxic, non-mutagenic, non-carcinogenic, non-endocrine disrupting, just makes sense. When we built this structure, uh, it turned out that when you blew up Jason's little red list, which he deceptively pulled us into, and you keep these 16 categories out of your building, it turns out we found 362 common building materials that were on the red list. Uh, but it turns out we were also able to build the building, keeping all of them out. It was more work, but it will be less work for the next building that does it because the list is already out there and it's on our website. And there's going to be more and more of that happening. Third, with regard to the uh, major the, the comment that, that somebody made about the um, formidability of the challenge ahead of us in the next 10 to 20 years of addressing globally the climate issue, uh, and coupling that with Jason's comment about America, I, I would just remind us that on a number of instances, we've, we've come to crossroads, ignored them, failed to take exit ramps that were easily available to us. In the Carter administration, a lot of people remember his call for the moral equivalent of war, but the inherent core of that was the goal of getting 20% of the nation's energy from solar by the year 2000. I was running the solar research program at that time and responsible for designing that plan. We had it, and we followed it. We would have been a 20% goal by 2000. And by today, I think we would have been approaching 50% instead of less than 1%. These were conscious political choices made. Um, I, I had a half a dozen others, but that would get on too long. The law of natural selection, it's, it, it's awkward, but when we think of ourselves as part of nature, you have to think of nature as providing meat. Uh, humans and our livestock are by far now the largest source of potential animal food in the world largest source of protein. It's like 80% of the animal protein in the world is now human beings and the animals that we've domesticated. Uh, I don't think we're particularly worried about, for the most part, most of us, lions and tigers and alligators eating us, but there are a whole lot of small little things, particularly microorganisms, that are now seeing us as a, as a hugely attractive diet. Um, Dana's comment on fat grains, there's swelling up with information. This is just sort of an interesting little factoid, but I think it has within it a profound truth. We, we tend to think of there as being a continuum from information to knowledge to wisdom, but we've had an explosion of information that has not been leading us in that direction at all, but in fact maybe leading us in a different direction. Uh, we are now creating more information, more data, every 10 minutes than was created from 
beginnings 200,000 years ago up through 2003. And so the explosion is really the last 10 years. And I, I think you can make a pretty decent case that, that, that that really is just an explosion of noise that is making knowledge more difficult to define and to comprehend. And without the knowledge, then wisdom becomes an impossibility. That's a great thing to leave us with there, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, it, it begs the huge question of, of what it takes to turn the explosion of noise into knowledge and wisdom, and I'm sure you all have thoughts on that. I'm going to read now a couple of things that are uh, have been sent in from people on the webinar, and then um, also again see if uh, Randy Hayes wants to say something here. Okay, so first from Suzanne York, let me just read. We know so much of what to do to improve our lives and environment. By changing the industrial agriculture system, and especially animal agriculture, could have an almost immediate effect. Less deforestation, less carbon emissions, less dead zones, less pollution, and so on. Yet agribusiness is so powerful. With more and more people eating meat-based diets, can we really change this system? Would implementing a rights to nature approach be the best hope for the environment, wild species, and domestic animals. None, none of you have mentioned that frame. We, we had a session before on, on what uh, Gus Speth called Earth Law that got us into um, the rights of nature, but that's one question. And then uh, let me turn uh, also to Randy Hayes for another. Uh, Harley, would you mind moving this, this down um, to Randy? Yeah, hi everybody. I, I was just responding to your, your question about the, the Earth's crust and the principles of uh, the natural step. You know, in the 70s, there was a lot more discussion about renewable resources and non-renewable resources than I hear, you know, more recently um, in the general dialogue of sustainability. But it just strikes me that that um, we would we would want to have a closed loop zero waste sustainable production and consumption system as a general principle of the alternative model for deep long term sustainability. I mean, I think we would all, you know, agree with that. But you particularly want it with non renewable resources. So I would say the stuff that's already been mined, you know, we can't easily disconnect from the, the minerals and metals in the system right now. And it would probably it would probably behoove this project to look at kind of a scenario, like a, a, a narrative that David Corton calls for, kind of a storytelling narrative, on at what point have we kind of removed our foot from the throat of the crust of the earth by, say, 80 percent, <laughs> right? And how, and how at that point do we keep the uh, non-renewable, they shouldn't be called resources because they're not sourced again and again, the non-renewable sources in that closed loop vein, right? And and then likewise, one wants to use renewable resources in the same closed loop zero waste sustainable production and consumption vein, but they do wear out differently, right? So when you take paper and recycling paper, at a certain point, you need 20% virgin fiber to go into the recycled paper to maintain its strength. Well, that's okay. You know, we can do that in society. So I can I can picture, you know, uh, a kind of a, a phase transition where we're sort of 80 percent with our foot off the throat of at least the Earth's crust, and then 80 percent along the way to mimicking the principles of the alternative economic model for deep long term sustainability, the, the new economy, whatever one wants to call it. You know, but. Um, the language is not unimportant, like the point about sources and resources. It also strikes me that that a closed-loop sustainable production and consumption system is maybe the wrong language as well. Uh, we maybe need to come up with something other than production and consumption, because when you extract oil, you're not producing it. You know, Amory Lovins was brilliant on this, you know, decades ago. You know, don't tell me you're producing. You know, the oil companies don't produce oil. They extract it. Right, and so I think we need a language component to our alternative economic model 
where we at least internally start to use a different kind of language that's part of the new story that David's calling for. And maybe something like instead of production and consumption, you know, closed loop cycle, it's really more something like assemble, consume, and reassemble, you know, along the, you know, as was mentioned about mimicking the, the ways of nature. Okay, let me, um, I'm going to read just one more here, and then we'll, we'll put it back to the four of you in any order you want. I mean, I think we should maybe let Dennis go first so that all the stuff he's been writing down he actually gets to say. Uh, this is from someone who's on the webinar whose name is, is uh, this is from Lena here. Is voting with a fork a rich person's thing? Yeah. Sorry, is voting with a fork a rich person's thing? Organic food, solar panels, and green buildings are still way more expensive than conventional products. How can we make the transition accept accessible to everyone? How can we make people who are already struggling financially, wait, how can we make people who are not struggling financially pay more? Oh, I see what you mean. I'm sorry. It's, it's, yeah, it's a moral question. Yeah, how can we how can we have people who are already struggling struggling financially pay more? Okay, which of you would like to, to go first and we can change the order up a bit? Jason, you go ahead. Well, you know, this is something that we work with a lot, um, especially around green building, because obviously a lot of what we promote uh, in the current economic framework uh, does cost more. Um, that's not because it ultimately does cost more, be, because I guess we've already talked about we externalize a lot of the costs. But, but in terms of to the average person, uh, some of what we promote costs more. Um, but the thing to remember is, uh, and I think this applies uh, to food as well as to building, uh, really, and, and to products, is that um, there's always something that you can do. Uh, regardless of, uh, of your economic level, that this isn't an all or nothing issue. Uh, certainly there are some things that, that for now, unfortunately, uh, is, it does require more resources. And I think it's specifically uh, on people that have the resources to support those things to drive costs down and to change the economic model. And we've certainly seen that with photovoltaics, which uh, have been uh, a, a more expensive proposition uh, and not something that people casually can purchase. Um, but the price of solar has been dropping precipitously, while at the same time the efficiency of solar is increasing, which is a wonderful you know, set of trends, um, in making it more and more affordable. Uh, for people to do. And at the same time, as it becomes more affordable, you start getting other funding mechanisms in place, incentives in place, which again makes it more accessible to more people. Um, we've seen the same with food in different ways. With initially organic food, the price points were much higher uh, than, than now. Um, the other thing to remember is that people, they t what, they, what they choose to value in most, for the most part, really is the issue, not so much the cost, but what they choose to value. Uh, when we choose to value something that, that uh, doesn't help us, um, we are in fact spending our money in, in unproductive ways. Um, so we tend to, the average American tends to buy a lot of things that they don't really need, that doesn't really make their lives better, and then they suddenly feel like they can't afford to buy organic food. Um, when in fact, they could afford to buy organic food and perhaps they need to forgo some of the activities they're not even in their best interests. Uh, and this applies to everybody. Um, so you, again, what I just wanted to respond to is that, that thankfully there's, there are things, green building, food, uh, products, that anyone pretty much um, you know, can afford to do. And that's what you should do. And for those that are able to do more, they have an obligation, I think, to do more. Great. Who would like to go next? Which of you? Dennis, go for it. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, before you do, could you try again to get your microphone closer to your mouth? <laughs> I'm really okay. sorry with this. Is this better? Yeah, it's good. And we appreciate you what that? you're doing there. De Dennis's issue is he's sitting in a big uh, building there with lots of people around him. So. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, and thanks, Noel, for muting Dennis when he's not speaking. So, <laughs> Dennis, you take a crack at it. Okay, great. Uh, a, a handful of specific odds and ends. Uh, I, 
I am a gigantic fan of Gus Speth and a fan of a number of the people. He was one of the co-founders of NRDC, who led the environmental litigation revolution, and of uh, the increasing prominence of the public trust doctrine as a way to bring some of these issues to bear. I do think that it places an enormous burden on the courts, and they are the branch of government that does not have an army, does not have a police force, does not necessarily represent the public will, and I'm candidly much more in favor of building a democratic constituency for these things than to have it imposed. And finally, given what has happened to the judiciary over the last 20 years, I'm not at all convinced that, that although we've still got courts of appeals that can be coming through on this, that that this holds a long-term answer to us. It, it, it's worth exploring, but we do not want the Supreme Court weighing in on the wrong side of that issue. So that's that's a, a strategy issue. Second, with regard to closed loops, um, I mean, this is one of those places where price mechanisms actually are enormously valuable. If you've got something that has a huge amount of uh, energy that is embodied in it, and that was expensive electricity, uh, and that then means that, if, uh, to take the obvious example, if you can be recycling aluminum instead of mining and refining bauxite and saving 95% of the electricity, suddenly aluminum is worth enough that we recycle enough every year now in the United States to replace our entire aircraft fleet. I mean, that's a lot of aluminum, and we can have that same sort of thing going. I don't think it hurts people in different economic strata, it's one of these cases where you pay a little bit more upfront for the container, but you have something that's hugely valuable that you can return at the other end as well. Um, so it's, it's just basically a, a behavior motivator rather than a discriminatory economic. Assuming that everything's structured well, that I know can always be a, a big assumption. And that leads into voting with your fork. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this is always going to be a, a tough one. Uh, Jefferson argued that people should not eat meat as courses of meals, that they should eat it as garnish, they should eat it as condiments. And that if, if that happens, then you get ample protein, you can do it in a way that's affordable, you're spending, you're spending, you're spending no, money, no more that you have an absolute right to have three Big Macs a day, then you will not be able to do it under our current agricultural system doing this. And that goes also back to the question, is it going to be necessary to change our lifestyles? And I think it's not only necessary, but it is desirable, no matter how you look at it, to be cutting back on the unhealthy food that is now very affordable, uh, but is really also very bad for us. And finally, a little, oh, I, I, let me say one other thing with regard to meat. Um, when we went out to interview a lot of dairy farmers and ranchers for, in, in the process of writing this book, Cow, we found a ton of them, almost all of them, no, I'd say all of them, small, all of them 500 animals or fewer, many of them very politically conservative, who are working incredibly hard to do this right, to do it sustainably, very conservative people who, who are using part of their farmland as, as wildlife sanctuaries, and as things that contribute to bird migration, folks you would not have expected just in terms of their overall stance on a variety of other issues, but but get into this and, and would in fact be very comfortable talking about biomimicry as part of how they're doing it. Within that, and this is not without exceptions, but there was an interesting thing. If, if they had names for their cows, they tended to behave better. If they had numbers for their cows, they tended to behave worse. And there's something, something in there, I think. And then finally, with regard to photovoltaics, uh, just standing on Jason's shoulders on this, as a general rule now, if you look back all the way back to the mid-1970s until today at global production, there's something akin to Moore's law. Every time that we have doubled the worldwide production of photovoltaics, the average cost has gone down about 18%. That's not going to go on forever. but, but uh, but there are some new technical possibilities of new materials and other things that may allow it to go on for quite a while into the future, until the point where solar literally becomes ubiquitous. And, and, and finally, I keep saying finally, there is a vision that, that I think is a, a credible one. It's one that I've held for uh, maybe a third of a century now. That much as when nature moves into an area that is somewhat barren, 
it, it takes sunlight and photosynthesis to convert that into something that is healthy. We had Mount St. Helens exploded out here. It turned the whole surrounding area into a barren wasteland. First things that we got were some mosses and some lichens, and then it came up and made a little bit of topsoil and some ferns and plants got into that. You go into it now in places that were just uh, solid lava uh, after the explosion uh, are, are now Douglas fir forests, and it was all powered by sunlight that was captured through photosynthesis throughout this entire area. If you go up on a drone and look down at the rooftops of any American city, it, it, it is a little bit analogous to Mount St. Helens after the explosion. And I think that something could be done with really efficient, affordable, foldable tanks covering all of that area and suddenly becoming an enormously rich uh, new source of energy for us as a civilization. Thank you very much, Dennis. That seems to be a lead-in right, right to you, Dana. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add in at this moment? Yeah, I actually want to come back to the idea of the stories that we believe. Um, and I think the key to painting a world that, you know, we're not embarrassed to pass on or mortified to pass on to the next generation um, is, is really questioning why do we behave the way that we do and having the empathy uh, to understand human behavior and, and it fundamentally comes down to me uh, for me is the stories that we've been led to believe and therefore we can believe a different set of stories. Um, the comment earlier about the language that we use is so fundamentally uh, clear and you know we try to promote using a biological language so really do you need to drive that idea through or can you fertilize your ideas and just choosing your verbs fundamentally changes the way uh, we view our relationship with the natural world and being willing to say that you know back to the the comment of the earth as, as mother that we see in indigenous cultures uh, being so common across these indigenous tribes is is honoring that inherent worth in nature which is what the rights to nature uh, space um, sort of is is ultimately about and if you what I what I'm sort of shocked to, to realize as a biologist I'm trained as a biologist it, it is that so few people actually believe that they are at least at the same level um, as nature they all such a large majority of society believes that we stand on a pedestal above nature. And that fundamentally changes the way we behave across the board. I mean, if you believe that the earth is here for us to consume, that there is no such thing as limits and boundaries, and that the afterlife is probably more uh, valuable than the current life, then all of our behavior makes sense. That's a perfectly behave as a species if that's the story and if you look at the media if you look at the language if you look at, at, at the dominant message that travels around the world those are the underlying premises but if you start framing a different story that maybe we're on the same level um, that maybe the earth has been around a little longer than we have and that we are a part of it uh, instead of it in service to us and that there are such things as limits and boundaries and that those are an opportunity not to overcome but to be as creative as we possibly can in that space. In fact, back to the metals and minerals point before, from a design perspective, it's a really primitive crude way that we do our world. Like metals, that's like such an easy way to accomplish something. I mean, if we really want elegant design solutions, there's a lot more options out there. And we've sort of taken the cheapest, crudest, most, and when tasked, actually I can't drill 3,000 uh, meters beneath the, or the surface to get my energy source, then, oh, maybe I'll try photosynthesis. Maybe that's an idea that we could tap into. So using these limits to empower the creativity that really is possible is, I think, where the opportunity comes from. But it's only if we change, to, to Jason's point, you know, what we choose to value or what we choose to believe is the story that dictates our behaviors. Um, and if we only believe that there's two stories, either the brown bag loincloth story or technological wizardry story, 
then we've really sold ourselves short. Um, that there's actually another story that, especially in the environmental movement, we've really failed to craft. Um, and people want to run towards something they're excited about, not run away from something they're afraid of. And so by changing that story and really making it vivid, then I think we'll have something else that we can believe in. And it doesn't just have to be panels on our roof. Maybe the whole skin of our entire building should be generating energy. I mean, that's what an aspen does. Uh, that's why they're white, because if they were brown, they couldn't absorb light through their bark. So their whole skin absorbs energy. Totally change the story, and then that's what we can believe, and then we make it happen. Dana, that, that was a beautiful blurb for David's uh, forthcoming book. <laughs> uh, uh, David, David, do you want to add anything at this point? I do. I, you know, I, I love what Dana was saying about her story, and, uh, you know, I've become almost obsessed with the issue of the story frame, partly recognizing that the the political power of the corporate right rests very much on their ability to control our framing story as a society and you know i i know we've all been through this discussion before that those of us on the progressive side tend to organize around issues and facts and occasionally values uh, but we rarely address the deeper framing story so the corporate story starts out that money is wealth, making money creates wealth. So there's, you know, there's part of the language distortion right there. Money's just a number. It's an accounting entry. It is not wealth. What is wealth? Well, that gets us into the generative systems of Earth. That's creating real wealth. That is the ultimate constraint on our uh, on our consumption. But the other piece of it that we haven't mentioned at all is is the story by which we define ourselves. What what are we? What does it mean to be human? Now again, the corporate story is well. Uh, we're we're consumers. We're individualistic, greedy consumers, and uh, um, and we're inherently competitive, and that's how we advance society. Uh, the new living earth story is you know, fun. Life is fundamentally cooperative. Uh, the systems of Earth are fundamentally cooperative. The the or the cells and organisms of our body are essentially cooperative otherwise we could not maintain the conditions of life now uh, I, I actually want to mention since Sarah Van Gelder is there in in the room uh, she might want to comment on this she's just coming out with a yes book on happiness um, you know which of course is the key to to looking at okay what does it truly mean to be human what is it that brings us true satisfaction um, and you know it's it's not necessarily consuming the, the most gadgets uh, it's certainly not beating down our neighbors to uh, uh, to get a jump on them uh, you know it, it's about being part of a contributing member of, of a living community uh, even the whole idea that we can um, can um, free ourselves from uh, from the need to work so we can just sit around watching television or play golf or whatever, uh, also completely ignores what we understand about what it is that really energizes, it makes us feel alive, uh, gives us a sense of happiness. Um, so, I, you know, we've, we've really got to pay attention to, to the framing stories and how do we get control of that away from, from uh, the corporate right. And part of what gives me hope, again, uh, that the Dana touched on, um, the you know, the universality of this living earth story among indigenous peoples. And as, as we have these conversations, I'm absolutely convinced that story lives in the human heart. All we have to do is liberate it, give people permission to express it and, and explore it. Um, and that is, that is suppressed, again, by the corporate control of the media and control of the story. And if none of us are actually out there speaking living earth, we are living beings born of a living earth then nobody hears it and nobody engages in that conversation. But I, I think we can break that conversation open very quickly if we put our minds to it. Okay, um, Sarah Van Gelder, is there anything you'd like to add about uh, the happiness uh, piece that David just raised before we turn to others? A uh, little, little bit? Uh, okay, Dave, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. 
Um, you, you still reserve, there, there's still time for you to do this if you'd like. And I know, David, at a certain point before the end, we also want to let um, uh, Yes Magazine in to talk about its next issue. Let me, yeah, though, take mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let me take two questions that have come in from webinar participants. One, uh, Robert Richardson. In David Cleveland's new book, Balancing on a Planet, he proposes two solutions to the problem of climate impacts from the agri-food system, reducing food waste and motivating dietary change. I would welcome feedback from any panelists regarding these suggestions in terms of their feasibility. Thank you. And, and that's you know, going to be for you, Dennis, and for any of you. I'm struck that a lot of questions here or comments have to do with the food system. I do think it's partly because people do see such movement in that area and because around the world, the old system is so failing people that it is universally recognized as failing. And that, back to Dana's point, what speeds up innovation and change, the failure in the food system, it feels like it is doing that in, in, in different parts of, of the world. And then Larry Chang, presenters and comments are all on right track. But moral and cognitive suasion will not get us to scale in time. We do not have centuries to work this out. Governments and politics are inefficient and cumbersome. Money is still the name of the game. Under the profit motive facilitated by the monetary system, until, sorry, until the profit motive facilitated by the monetary system is removed, the prevailing modus operandi will be more of the same. Dana's point is cogent. Until we can adapt to a new post-genetic code that governs our economy, we shall surely perish. Um, okay, so those are two comments. Anything else from here before we turn it back to, uh, to our folks? Did that uh, stimulate you to want to say more, <laughs> Sarah, at this point? No. Okay, all right. We, okay, Noel Ortega wants to say something, and then we'll, we'll, turn, back, we'll turn back to all of you. Noel. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists. This is, this is a great conversation. Um, one thing that I've noticed um, that hasn't really been touched upon a lot is um, people, in other words, uh, workers. How do we envision or how does that play into the role of the different principles of design? Um, are we thinking about worker-owned types of businesses or companies, corporations that will design and build these buildings? Um, mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's one of the, um, that's my only comment I have, uh, and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it begs, um, it's sort of back to you, Jason. It, it does beg the question, you mentioned that you have 250 um, bullet centers <laughs> that you've helped stimulate around the world, um, uh, and nobody has mentioned uh, ownership models. We do view um, a more democratic ownership of the economy is one of the pillars of a new economy in the, in, in the work that we've put forward. And we'd be curious to know a little bit more from your experience. I mean, how have you addressed those issues? And also, I'm very struck, you know, Dennis said that um, he, he knew a way in the late 70s to get us to 20% solar by 2000, and we'd be at 50% solar by now, and we're just at 1%. I'm curious where you feel we are on the, the transformation of, of the building economy. Um, Den Dennis said we learned a lot of things in making the Bullet Center that will make it easier for the next one. How far along the way are you towards transforming the way we think about buildings and we, and we build buildings? Um, okay, back to you all. Who, who would like, anybody else like to go first this time? <laughs> uh, from these comments? David. Uh, yeah, actually, a, a brief issue on ownership. I mean, those who've participated know that we regularly talk about ownership and cooperative ownership. I just want to note that uh, I'm working with, uh, with John Fullerton um, on a future webinar session um, that will explore some ideas that he's putting forward that I think can be extraordinarily powerful in transforming the systems of ownership, starting with uh, pension funds and endowment funds, just on basic principles of finance, uh, to begin to expose the 
the extent to which the the Wall Street um, casino <laughs> casino financing is contrary to fundamental uh, fundamental uh, f financial investment principles for organizations that are uh, that are actually trying to invest for stable long-term returns rather than quick speculative returns. Um, and, you know that's a different conversation, but I, I, I want to alert people to it because I think we're I think we're maybe getting a handle on that question that goes way beyond anything we've discussed before. Great, Dana, you're next. So those are sort of three random questions. I'm going to try to stitch them together um, a little bit and and go back to again speaking on behalf of the other 30 million species. <laughs> been around a little longer than we have. Um, nature uh, has no notion of ownership. <laughs> like the whole idea of ownership is non-existent. Uh, you, uh, you don't that got some sense of boundaries that this is mine and that's yours and therefore I can only manage this space and not that space, which is completely antithetical to a story in which you actually understand how interconnected and interdependent everything is. Um, and so until we sort of really, really disperse, I mean, there's nothing more than a democratic ownership is just dissolving those boundaries is what we're trying to do and, and to accept that. Uh, and at the same time, there's no such thing as, I mean, there is profit if we define it in the sense of, um, of enhancing uh, the conditions for life. That, that there's a regenerative capability, that would be profit. But there's no such thing as money either because, as David said, it's a surrogate for value and nature doesn't use surrogates. As soon as you use surrogates, you have the ability to misinterpret them, the feedback loops are convert. There's really only an exchange of value that is true value. There's not a surrogate version of it. So therefore, you can't have profit of a surrogate because that doesn't that doesn't exist. It's just a false notion of our belief in an interpretation of a story. Um, and so, yeah, fundamentally, we've got to acknowledge at that at that core space. Um, and so, there's some actual interesting work going on in biomimicry, which takes our life's principles and applies them to finance um, and financial policy and applies them to investing and what are the, the sort of the guidelines for investing. There's a fairly new book out by Catherine Collins, who's a biomimicry specialist, that's called The Nature of Investing. And it, she's taken life's principles and applied them to uh, investing. Um, and then this is again where if we really start asking nature, how do we manage all these things? One of the prize winners for the student design challenge where the topic was water, and that a huge amount of water is wasted because 50% of our food ends up in the waste and doesn't actually get consumed. And therefore, we're growing stuff, putting a lot of water on it, and it's not actually a good use of water if we're just going to throw it away. So they asked, how does nature you know, preserve materials so that they don't waste? And they designed a completely low-cost, non-energy-based system um, that preserves perishable goods for an additional two weeks longer than they would in, in regular environments. And they've got prototypes, they're taking them through Morocco and through most of North Africa now. Students, like these were university students in the Netherlands that, that pulled this off by asking those fundamental questions. Um, and so, it, you know, at the core of what biomimicry is about is what would nature do? Well, she wouldn't have ownership, she wouldn't have profit. Um, this is how she would preserve materials. And to me, that's why I work in this field, is that there's an endless supply of creative solutions to the problems that we have if we're just willing to ask those questions, which means stepping off of our pedestal and being willing to admit we don't have all the answers. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, students in the Netherlands have always been at least 30 years ahead of the rest <laughs> of us in my whole experience. Um, Jason, do you want to go next? Sure, sure, and I've been thinking about uh, the mix of questions as well. Um, I, I know that in you know in terms of green building, we've certainly had to play within a set of rules that hasn't been fair um, economically. Where we've certainly we've had to we've had to prove ourselves with one arm tied behind our back. Uh, 
and even under those terms, we're starting to win, uh, is my belief. And 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 the, you know, and so you know, capitalism can be used to move us towards a, a better state potentially, even under these terms. Uh, you know, when I when I think about green building, even a decade ago, um, and LEED is a good proxy here, and I'll, I'll use that as a proxy. Um, when LEED first was was launched. Uh, everyone said it was going to be too expensive, no one would do it, um, and uh, if the market would never be shifted. And in less than a decade, uh, LEED is a global phenomenon now, and there are millions of square feet of projects that go through certification, and these represent sizable improvements across a variety of spectrum, uh, and often for zero-cost premiums. So within the, within the current inequitable and unjust economic framework, we're actually still producing better buildings for no cost premium. Uh, now we're with the Living Building Challenge. We've raised the bar, and this is part of you know it depends where your baseline is. And we think we have to go much further than LEED does, and we have to go much deeper. But even then, the same things were said when we launched the we launched the Living Building Challenge in 2006. And initially, everyone said too hard. No one is ever going to do this. Uh, it's going to cost three times as much and all these uh, different excuses. And again, even within the unfair economic system, and Dennis is proof positive, proof, proof positive of this, that you can do this. And, and while that level still currently costs uh, more, it's not astronomically more. And each building that, uh, that follows uh, you know, every other living building, it gets cheaper and cheaper. And I think that we're seeing, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know why I keep going back to solar, but I'm so excited about the potential here, um, where, uh, you know, there were, we're not that far off, in my belief, for, for even, again, under the current inequitable framework, where solar will be cheaper, and then we win. We change the, the way we generate energy. Uh, that's I think we're not far off. And now the scary thing is that we're in this, it's like a space race. We're in this race between the state of the planet and the constant degradation that's happening and the changes that we're seeing that are positive, the positive future that is being created by visionaries all over the world, the innovation that Dana and everyone on the panel has talked about is happening. The change is happening because an idea as powerful as the ideas that we're talking about cannot be stopped. It cannot be resisted. And we are going to change the systems that we're in. The question is, are we going to change them within the time period that we need to change? But I, I'm convinced that we are going to shift the way we generate energy, that we're going to shift the way we're building, and we're going to shift the way we produce food and, and every other every other uh, sector of, econ of the economy. So um, that's my response. That's great. Uh, Dennis, say, say whatever you were about to say, but are you are you feeling as optimistic as that? Uh, <laughs> well, as a professional environmentalist, I, I'd be run out of the club if I was optimistic. Uh, but there, 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 there certainly are a, a, a lot of interesting things that are going on. One, one of the comments, questions was, maybe your observation, John, that so many of these things have dealt with food. Um, I think one reason for that is that it's it's been one of the success stories where, in, in the United States in particular, where kind of dramatic changes happen. When I was an undergraduate, the sort of food approach that's now become commonplace for 20% of the society was just a small handful of hippies at the University of California at Santa Cruz. I mean, and, and now we've got it having spread across the country, cooperative markets essentially everywhere, people planting their own gardens. The first lady, Michelle Obama, calling upon people to have smart diets and to lend their uh, commerce to locally grown fruits and vegetables. And so, of course, there's some focus because in a world where there are a huge number of things going on in the global economy and the international war and peace and cultural clashes and vast religious things happening, discrimination, food seems to be something that, honest to God, we can make progress on and do it. So it's, it's kind of uh, natural that we fall on that. I'll, I'll say a couple of things that may actually uh, uh, be not divisive, I hope, but, but a little bit at variance with uh, some of the mood of the group, um, if, if nothing else to keep it spirited. None of this is what my wife and I call in the midst of an argument a WTOP. Is, is that a well-thought-out position? Uh, you know, 
every couple gets involved in these struggles, typically late at night, where you're saying things that are manifestly absurd and getting increasingly sort of heated. At some point, somebody steps back and says, oh, is that a WTOP? And you realize what you've just said is so extremely ridiculous. And no, it isn't. You can both laugh and, and move on. These are not WTOPs, but, but I, I, I think there are things that I, I feel, although perhaps not think about carefully enough, but I, I think it's worth saying. One, the comments on messaging and storytelling, I think, are absolutely right on the market. But the vehicles for storytelling, the medium by which you can communicate these messages, is, is, is really the big deficiency. I had occasion many years ago to review a, a couple of books about the pioneers that developed television. I mean, they had a vision. I mean, this, this, this was going to be the great democratizing influence. Television was going to be bringing opera to the American homelands. It was going to be the vehicle by which we teach calculus to people who have lousy grade school and high school teachers. It was a genuinely revolutionary technology among the people who were figuring out how to make it work. Uh, without saying that's not what happened. There were a great many of us that had similar sorts of hopes for the internet. But then as we moved into search engines of increasing sophistication and building business models that were all about maximizing rates of return, it became the most effective marketing machine that we've seen. We can now follow people as they browse the aisles in stores and send them coupons for whatever product they happen to be sitting right in front of. And it's getting ever more sophisticated. Pinterest is now the one that everybody's focused on because Facebook and Google are talking about what people have done in their past patterns. But Pinterest is this aspirational thing that gives um, sellers of goods and services insights into what people aspire toward in the future. And so we've got people saying this is going to be really transformational because it also mostly occurs on mobile devices. Converting all of this into getting the kind of alternative narrative that we're talking about so that it happens and happens at a, at a sufficiently rapid pace is, is I think a challenge that smarter brains than mine have to have to somehow apply themselves to. I think we can figure out the stories. I don't think we've got an idea yet about how to communicate them. And finally, I, I will say with regard to ownership models, I've you know, got a law degree at the business school. I understand why we have public companies. But by and large, I think it's a, it's a really, in many regards, for the issues we're talking about here today, a, a terrible form of ownership. Anything that, that places enormous emphasis upon quarterly returns and annual returns and links executive compensation to what they did in the spring quarter. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's just idiotic for a society, that, that a world that needs to be going through profound long-term uh, revolutionary change and one that has to approach the discounting of future value far differently than can be done in a publicly traded company. Um, and we've all talked about some of those alternatives. I'm, I'm a big fan in the agricultural area of, of family ownership, but in many cases, family and institutional and co-ops and what have you. Now, here's the one that may be splitting us a little bit apart. I, I got into all of this out of a concern for biomimicry before we really had a vocabulary for all of that. I was, was deeply committed to urban ecology and industrial ecology and human ecology. And those words just didn't exist, but they were theories about how one could learn from nature to organize ourselves better. Implicit in all of that is the sort of comment that Dana has made occasionally about, we need to remember that we are a part of nature. Uh, we're, we're, it's not us looking at nature, but, but, but it's us as an inherent part of nature. And yet, in this field, we constantly talk about us learning from nature as though we are not part of nature, as though we are somehow this, this non-natural species that needs to look at everything else differently, that we put ourselves on a pedestal, whereas you could make a case that we've got ourselves in a niche. Uh, there, there's been interesting studies about our two closest relatives, at least genetically, uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. They are wildly different uh, in, on things like murder and war. Chimpanzees are constantly going to war with one another and killing one another. One of those, hardly ever. They have a murder rate, something like a tenth of a percent of the chimpanzees do. But we share 99% of our genetic heritage with, with both of them. And, and there may be things that we do that 
are not the same way that an elk would have behaved or a beaver would have behaved in a particular circumstance because we are different than them. But what we want to do, I think, is recognize that we inhabit a particular niche. We do have mental capacities for abstraction, for synthesis, and that we ought to be looking for things that, honest to God, work throughout the rest of the biosphere and, and employ them. But the fact that we can't find something someplace else in nature, but that it works for us, may simply mean that we've got a different niche and, and, and that this is what we should be doing. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Now, we have time for just one more round here, and, and Dennis did just throw a bit of a challenge to the rest of you. So let me just, I'm just going to read two more comments, and then you each, each of you, the four of you, would have two to three minutes, and, and we'll let David in. We'll put you last, David, and let Dean Patton in at that, at that moment as well to say a word about the next issue of Yes. But, um, so let me read these two. Georgia Kelly. Uh, so Dennis brought up the fact that when Carter was president and Jerry Brown was governor of California for the first time, we thought we were well on the way to living with renewable energy sources. We thought we would be well on our way to living with renewable energy sources by now. But when Republicans replaced these leaders, we reverted to the default mode in our culture, one that insists on maintaining the economic status quo. We have economic interests that have the power to reserve our gains, and they do. Reverse our gains, I think she meant, and, and they do. With this example before us, how can we prepare for this backlash as we start gaining real ground? So that's from Georgia. And then finally, Paul Bauman. Nature do, does have ownership. Uh, this is back to you, Dane, I think. Nature does have ownership. It doesn't have surrogates like money, certainly. But story is equally a surrogate. Nature doesn't have storytelling, except in that human beings are natural. There's a great challenge simply to find ways to talk about healthy human participation and partnership in natural systems without self-contradiction. Okay, that's a big one. We will let you <laughs> let you think about that for a minute, Dana. Um, okay, so let's go back. This is final round, um, Jason. Um, if you're ready to go first, we'll go with you and and. Uh, well, <laughs> two to not, three minutes there. <laughs> and anything you and if you want to respond to Dennis as well, um, or any of the things you've heard up till now, this is your opportunity. No, I'm uh, I'm kind of wanting to pass this one off. <laughs> <laughs> I can start. <laughs> Maybe I'll respond to, to Dana. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I don't I don't mind starting. Um, right. So yeah, I think you're right, Dennis, and, and, and I catch myself all the time when we talk about learning from nature. Um, and and, and it's, a, it's a short sort of easy, quick way to say what we really want to say is learning from the other 30 million species. Um, and reminding ourselves when we say nature as well, because a lot of people will put mountains and streams and other things that are you know, part of the natural world in that same category. But what we are really talking about is learning from other biological beings. And the rationale behind that is based on the idea, and again, coming back to that 3.8 billion years, um, that they have worked out some of the kinks. They've done the R&D. And that's why we also use these life's principles. So you're, you're right. We couldn't say, okay, well, we all need to behave like honeybees, and therefore I am the queen, and the rest of you are my drones. You can't sort of randomly choose which species are appropriate to emulate or not. Um, and, and, and so these master principles that all of them have in common are probably pretty good guiding principles. And oftentimes when I, when I give a, a talk, I do take the time to start the talk with the timeline because I think it puts a lot of things into perspective um, because we are, as much as we think that we're forward thinkers and we have the ability to project, um, we actually Whoops. Dana, we're not getting your sound. Dana, we just lost you. Hang on one second. We lost maybe the last 20 seconds. Yeah, it might be Dana's internet connection. And Dana, it, if you could. Dana, it may be your internet connection. Hang on just one second. 
Yeah. Dana, Dana we're not hearing you. Yeah. Dana, Dana we yeah, don't we hear you. hearing me? Oh, there you go. Oh, now, now, go, go. Now, now we, we lost maybe 40 seconds, Dana. Your, your audio okay. is cutting in and out a little bit. All right. Oh, well, now I don't know where I am, but that's... Yeah, I know. No, you, were, you were great. You were, you were like... I don't know, 300 million years ago, and you were. Um, <laughs> we got your honey. We got the bees. We got, we got the, that. Not the okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we need to be. We need to look at these generic life's principles because life has been around for 3.8 billion years, and we've been here a really, really short time. And yes, we do have a niche, but what I find fascinating and absolutely um, comforting, which you might all find a little perverse, is that uh, our species, Homo sapiens, has been here for about 200,000 years. Okay, So in the age of the planet at one year, so four and a half billion year old planet, at one year, that means that we've been here for about four and a half minutes, which is nothing, right? <laughs> nothing in that year. If we were all sent to a penal colony tomorrow, if Gaia said, that's it, I've had enough of you, I'm shipping you off to the moon, I want nothing to do with you anymore, it would only take 170,000 years, so about another four minutes, to erase all traces of humanity from this planet, to cover up the buildings, to get rid of the bridges. The only thing would be a few hot pockets of radioactive waste that would be left over. Um, but that's it, just another four minutes. And so for me, I think the other 10 and a half months that life's had to work something out definitely has something to teach us because we are, we're, we are uh, babies on the planet acting like teenagers. You know, <laughs> We're acting like we know what it means to live here and how to do this when indeed the other species might have um, some wisdom for us. Um, whenever I make statements around nature doesn't do this and doesn't do that, then, then definitely there's always someone in the room who goes, wait a minute, I have an example. <laughs> and I, I, I would love to hear an example actually of, um, uh, definitely, well, we heard the surrogates, but I, I really can't think of another one that around ownership. That's, that's, as a biologist, it's really hard for me to come up with one. But I can actually actually tell you of storytelling. Um, so just a quick story, again, to put things in perspective, because if we look with a different set of eyes, we see the world differently. Uh, about three years ago, a longtime champion of elephant conservation, I forget his name, um, passed away in, in South Africa. And within two days of his departure, uh, his, his dying, over 300 elephants from as much as seven different uh, areas of Africa traveled up to 150 kilometers to come and mourn his death. And they came outside his home and stayed for three days mourning his death, and then they all walked home. Now, if that's not telling a story and being able to convey it across kilometers, across, across species boundaries to pick up language. I mean, just because we can't understand the stories doesn't mean they're not being told. Definitely doesn't mean they're not being told. So we definitely have to just keep reminding ourselves of how um, innocent we really are and, and how little we really know and figuring out how we can put ourselves in a space to, to ask with that respect that is due uh, well, a th few billion years of experience. Thanks so much, Dana. Okay, Jason. <laughs> it's yours. Yeah, I'm ready now. I've been thinking about uh, the question about learning from the past in terms of um, uh, political gain and and uh, losing losing ground that was so hard uh, won to begin with. Uh, and and just but before I do that, uh, it's just wanted to say that this, since this is the last round, just what a delight it's been to be on this panel with all of you guys, uh, and uh, how much I appreciate being included. So thank you again for that. Um, you know, I I think there's a couple things to end on related to this. You know, we we can't predict the future um, in in real terms. We we can certainly see trends. Uh, we can learn a lot from 
from the victories and the defeats we've had in the past. Uh, sometimes, you know, we repeat the, the same cycles and other times we don't. I think that all we can do around these issues right now, uh, well, two things. Um, one is that, is that we can provide lasting models uh, for change that are better. I think that what we're seeing uh, with some of our work is that we're producing, for example, buildings that, that are not less comfortable and ugly and weird and, 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 uh, and difficult. And so therefore, you know, they're not so easily dismissed. We're producing buildings like Dennis, where Dennis is right now that are healthier, that are, uh, that are, that are more fun to be in, that are um, uh, just better places to work. And as we build these models, it begins to change what people think is possible. And that's not so easily shifted when the political winds change. Um, we, we focus on lasting real improvements to the lives of people. That's not so easily changed. And I think the, the final thing is, is that, and this goes back uh, to David and, and his reframing, is that if, if our victories are, 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 are not fundamentally affecting us, if they're really about something, changing something out there, they are easy to, uh, to, to rescind. But if we actually change the, the mythologies, the, the stories that govern us, we actually, again, that changes everything. Um, and that's what we, that's why I know David focuses on the work that he does and so much of what we do. It's interesting that, that while I'm in the building industry, we spend most of our time telling stories, talking about framings and turn the lights on in people's minds and not just on the left. I think that we, we have this problem where, that we talk amongst ourselves and we, 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 we create an other, the, them, you know, the right, the people that don't get it, the, the one percent or whoever the hell it is that we're talking about but we when we're really doing what we should be doing we find a way to be inclusive to everybody to provide a better story that that replaces these paradigms that that is so destructive and i i've had some wonderful discussions with some very conservative people that through the discussions and through the models they, be, they themselves become transformed in ways that, that often people on the left aren't, you know, so it really, you know, it's surprising. And that's the kind of change that we're seeking. It's lasting, it's fundamental, and it's a reawakening towards where, you know, who we are, you know, our place on the planet, and our place in society. And that kind of change is, I think, fairly immune to, uh, this, uh, to the kind of politics, at least, the shallow politics that uh, govern us today. Um, so with that, I again want to sign off then and uh, thank everyone. Now, thanks so much, Jason. You just made us feel better about the Republicans regaining those seats in the House of Senate <laughs> tomorrow, too. Uh, so, Dennis, we turn to you, and I just want to say, as you as you pointed out, that we 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 are we have the alternative narrative. It's just the question of how to communicate it. I want to let you know that three nights ago we had 50 people in this very room for Gus Beck. Uh, in his new memoir, fabulous new memoir, and to you, Dennis, and to you, David, uh, we invite you to come here with your new books next year, and we'll help you get your, we'll help you communicate your ideas to a, to a broader audience. Um, Dennis, is there anything, any final words you want to say to those two last questions, or to anything that, that Dana or Jason has just said? Um. Sure. A, a, a couple of quick things, because one of those questions in particular, I think, is, is something that uh, I had a bit of experience with, and I think it's terribly important. First, with regard to Dana, I will say this with some hesitance, because she knows vastly more about it than I do. But And, and recognizing that ownership is a weird concept, and it's enforced by courts, and we have exchanges of trinkets of value and things that are sometimes associated with it. But I do think that there's stuff in nature that I think of as being very, at least closely analogous to ownership. I mean, concern for territory is one of the really strong drivers of, of all kinds of, of, of different animals. Um, you, you want to uh, stick your hand into a beehive, you'll find out how aggressively they will protect that owned property that the hive comes together on. Uh, but where I take that is that um, there is no publicly traded company in nature. And 
I, I think that that form of ownership is something that we can't see out there, and there, there may be a lesson for us in the fact that nobody else has evolved to have that, and although it certainly has great elements for mobilizing capital, it has some enormously unfortunate things that, that uh, probably outweigh that. But the, the, the comment that I really wanted to make had to do with the Carter, Jerry Brown thing where with the Reagan election, suddenly things melted down probably more than the public even realized because so many things are melting down from ketchup as a vegetable to what have you. But when they finally caught up with us, which was a few months into the Reagan administration, um, and came out to the Solar Energy Research Institute, which is now the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, it wasn't a matter of, of tuning it down a little bit. Uh, they reduced our budget by 80%. They fired in one afternoon 40% of the staff. They terminated 100% of our contracts, including the two people who went on to win Nobel Prizes. Um, I used to take a, a degree of self-sarcasm from the fact that Reagan obviously thought that during his administration, all of the important things in America were going to be taking place in the private sector, so he, he felt that that's where I belonged as well. I was one of the 40% that got terminated back then. Uh, but it, it, it was devastating. People that I'd spent a lot of time convincing to give up tenure professorships and come out and join this. Manhattan Project for a benign, sustainable, renewable future. We're given two weeks' notice and no severance pay. It was, it was just cruel. Uh, what is different this time is that we're much farther along uh, in two regards. One, then all of the bets were inside the United States. Now a lot of the biggest bets are outside the United States. By far the largest uh, manufacturer of and consumer of solar electric devices is China. Uh, Germany kind of led us into this with a series of institutional shifts such as feed in tariffs that suddenly allowed for explosive growth which really brought prices down dramatically. Uh, Japan continues to be a leader technologically in terms of research in the field. And there are formidable major sources of political power and economic power that are now uh, committed to this and some, some very creative, dynamic leaders who have uh, some of those institutions at their uh, helm. And so, um, yeah, I, optimism, that's probably a stretch, but I, I do think that we learned some lessons last time around about what to avoid and that we are in a much stronger position at this time, assuming that in the next election a Reagan equivalent comes in and has a Republican Congress with him and tries to shut it down in the United States, I think the human species will still be in very good shape with regard to those technologies. Thanks so much, Dennis. Okay, um, final word to you, David, and 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 uh, feel free to bring in Dean Patton as well to say a word on the yes issue. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation with Dana. I think the the issues of how do we think about ownership, corporations, money, all of these things in relation to nature is amazing. Uh, you know, in terms of of the story and the the sense of of readiness. Um, you know, it's not just about living Earth. Um, there is an opening coming through of a, to, to discussions of the much deeper stories, the cosmologies uh, by which we define ourselves. Um, and I'm fascinated <clears throat> with the possibilities, both within the institutions of religion and of science of engaging these deeper stories. And again, sensing an, an openness um, that begins to converge around what, a, what a, some are calling the living universe cosmology. That it's not just life that is self-organizing, but that the whole of, of reality uh, is basically a, a, a spiritual expression or expression of an intelligent, aware consciousness seeking to know itself by becoming, and that all being is a manifestation, essentially of a creative journey. Um, and the contrary to science, which got stuck in the, uh, in the model of a mechanical universe back before it began to really uh, uncover the processes by which the cosmos 
and life unfold um, is I think beginning to get open to a recognition that there is more than mechanism and chance involved in this. But as we're beginning to get into in discussions in religion, it's not necessarily that the intelligence is all an external agent and some a distant patriarch or a distant god, but the intelligence is integral to the entire process, going right back down to uh, all the way down to quantum particles. Um, I mean, this is part of the truly deep reframing, and I'm very excited, particularly the openings within religion, to begin to carry this forward, um, because what you know, it's not just that we're rediscovering our living nature but it is also rediscovering our spiritual nature, which is a theme that on the progressive side we're pretty reluctant to, to discuss. Um, so with that, let me turn it over to, to, to Dean Patton. To, uh, Dean, tell us a little bit about uh, the upcoming YES issue and how, uh, how people might be looking forward to it, and particularly also how uh, they might be able to use it in their own work. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. All right, yes, good. I wasn't sure I was on. Um, Dennis talked about what a big problem it is that the media is so terrible at getting this story out there to the public. So in our spring issue, the spring issue of Yes Magazine, which comes out in mid-February, we'll be putting what Dennis called the alternative narrative out there in a more widespread way. At least we hope so. The spring issue is going to present many of the core ideas that we're talking about here to today. Well, there obviously some of it has to be big picture theory kinds of things, but there'll also be examples, concrete examples of things that people are already are doing and things the rest of us can do to begin changing the way that the developed world at least treats the planet that makes our lives possible. Some of the things Dana said would be great. I'd, I'd love to get some of your I ideas in there. And since Jason's here, I just want to point out that in our current issue, which is coming out in this month, Jason has a really strong piece on how to start to make cities something that we can really actually live in in the next century, not space age things or, or um, draconian dystopian cities. So check that out. That's just a side, side little trip there. Um, we're going to look at ways to integrate indigenous wisdom into our 20th, in, in, into 20, 21st century actions. And we may look at bioregionalism and permaculture. Permaculture, not just in agriculture, but even in, in all sorts of ways, urban settings, even in politics. We'll look at things that we can undo, things that you know have been done that aren't really great, like dam removal, for example, or soil renewal. So there's lots of things that we can do and talk about. We want to do things that help our readers understand why a new way of treating the earth must happen, and it must happen pretty soon. So we're looking for things all of us can do to help this change in our thinking evolve and move forward in a uh, real world way. So any questions or suggestions you have are much appreciated and I really appreciate being able to be part of this and hear what all of you have to say because it's so helpful to me in trying to pull an issue like this that's such a big topic and hard for people to grab onto maybe how to pull that together. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank, no, well, th Thanks so much, Dean. We, we unfortunately don't have time right now to get into it. I'm thinking maybe if you could give people a, um, an email address where people could send you comments. Sure, it's um, e. Patton, D -P -A -T -O -N, at yesmagazine.org. That's great. No, e P-A-T-O-N, yesmagazine.org. Fabulous. Um, no, thank you so much. We, we are running out of time. Um, Noel, you had a comment you wanted to add in? Yeah. Uh, so um, just, uh, I just want to encourage folks to use a forum. We've created a forum to continue the conversation going. So um, I'll send out the information for that so we can continue um, asking these questions and having this, this rich conversation online. It's great. Yeah, there are several of you who had things you wanted to say, and we've run out of time. But thank, thanks so much, Jason. Dana, Dennis, uh, thank you for joining this. Noel, we'll get you on the, the mailing list for future sessions. Uh, David, thanks so much for both your participation and, and really helping to pull this together. And Noel will be getting this session up on the website as well, and we'll, and, and we'll keep you informed on that and on future sessions. So with that, deep thanks.